Today, we are going to start learning about the C programming language, but I've also subtitled it a little differently, Computers in the Universe, because we are going to try and learn something deeper about the world from our study of the C programming language. I mean, it, it's great to learn a new programming language. It makes you more hireable in industry. You might learn new things about like, how to actually get stuff done. But because this is a computer science course, we actually want to learn something deeper, something about the world. And we'll see how the two connect as we go on through this lecture and through tomorrow's lecture. But don't worry, you will learn how to program. And I know some of you have asked, like, are we going to learn how to program in C in lecture? Are we going to learn how to do it in workshop? The answer is yes in both, but we are going to hope that you will follow along in the textbook as well and also practice on your own time to make sure that you actually build skills. Because programming, I like to think of it a little bit like woodworking. Someone can tell you how to do the most beautiful joinery, but until you actually get your hands dirty and start doing it yourself, you're not going to learn anything. So I can speak at you all day about the C programming language, but the most important thing is to get online and go practice. So why are we going to bother learning a different programming language? I think a bunch of you already know Python. Does anyone know a language other than Python at all? Yeah, what do you know? JavaScript. JavaScript. C++, great, a whole bunch of other languages. Yeah. SQL, that's an interesting one. We're maybe we'll have some time to talk about SQL at the end of semester. But okay, so you all know a bunch of programming languages. Why learn a different one? Well, programming languages vary in a whole lot of different angles that will give us different abilities as programmers, make things harder or easier depending on our circumstances, depending on the design of the programming language. Now, we're going to look at a few different distinctions. Uh, the first is between compiled and interpreted. Does this look like Python to anyone? No? This is Python. When your computer gets your piece of Python code, you run the program Python. I'm not sure if any of you did that. You probably used Rock a lot during the semester. But if you actually want to run Python on your own computer, you type the word Python, space, and then the name of the Python program that you've written. And what the program Python actually does is it takes what you've written and it converts it into something that looks like that. And then once it's converted into something that looks like that, it then converts it into what we call machine code or assembly code over here. So Python goes through this complex multi-stage process of interpretation. You take the thing that you've written in something that looks Kind of similar to English, you run it through Python, and, and in order to actually run your code, the Python program generates these instructions live on the fly. C is a bit different. In order to make a C program work, you first have to convert it, and then you stop, and then you run the program that has been generated for you. So unlike in Python, where it's a whole one-step process, you run Python with the name of your code file and it runs, in C you do two things. You compile the file, which means convert it from the C language and syntax, and turn it into that assembly. And then once it's turned into that assembly, it's no longer C. It's just an ordinary program on the computer that you run like anything else. And then you execute that program. And that's called a compiled programming language, which is C, where you have this multi-stage process, versus Python, which is interpreted, where you can run it all at once, but even though you run it all at once, under the hood, there's a lot of conversion happening. So that still doesn't answer why we would bother with this. Well, there are also other angles to consider. There are different types of programming languages and the way we express ourselves. We could use an imperative language, which is the computer goes through step by step and follows our instructions. This is how you're used to thinking about Python or JavaScript. SQL is a little different. SQL is what we call a declarative language. And this means you tell the computer what you want. You don't tell it how to do it. You tell the computer what you want. You say, I want everything inside this text file that matches the, that has the word Liam in it. And the programming language will give you back every line that has Liam in it. You don't have to tell it, look through every line, check if the line has Liam, print the line if it does. Instead, you just say, give me all the lines with Liam, and it does that. So that's a declarative language. And then the last paradigm, which I think is one of the coolest ones, is functional programming. And I'm not going to talk about this very much now, other than to say that it's very close to mathematics in that it allows you to compose functions. If you think like f of g of x, that's an example of doing a kind of functional representation of something. So instead of saying, uh, computer, check, read this line, then uh, go, go up to the top of the loop, if else, instead of that, you have compositions of functions. So your program might run f of g of k of x and just return the output of that. So there are different programming paradigms, and C is a compiled and an imperative language. So we're one different from Python. Python was, well, uh, Python was interpreted, 
And which one of these was Python? Imperative, yeah. So we've made one change, and that'll give us one more thing in our toolbox. And as you go along throughout your computer science degree, hopefully you'll explore some more of these paradigms. But I still haven't answered that question. Why? So we've got these bunch of paradigms. Why are we going to bother learning them? Well, there are a few useful things that C gives us. C is very closely tied to the underlying architecture of the computer, the way the thing is actually built. The bits and bytes inside the computer are represented very closely to the way they are in hardware in the programming language. It's also one of the most widely used languages and was also the inspiration for a lot of other languages. We'll get back to that in a second, which means you'd be very employable knowing C. It generates very small and very fast output programs, which means if you're building like an internet of things light bulb, there's probably some C code in there. Um, there's also a lot of tradition. I think we've been teaching C here for at least 30 years, maybe 40 years. Um, you can ask Alistair uh, how many years it's been since he joined the university, and that's probably the same number of years since he first started teaching C. Um, so we're following in the footsteps of giants, and uh, while history is invaluable for its own sake, it does give us some insight into everything that comes forward. Um, and so, what about this last point? Teach us deep truths about the university? Well, uh, about the universe, not about the university. Well, uh, it will hopefully teach us some things about the universe. The, the university, you'll have to come to my office hours. Um, why not learn C, though? Those, those seem like some reasonable reasons. Okay, what's, what sucks about this language? What are you going to be grumpy about during this semester? Well, C lets you shoot yourself in the foot over and over and over again. It's easy to make mistakes. It can be frustrating to correct those mistakes. The error messages that the compiler gives you can sometimes be opaque and uh, difficult to understand. But that means that you'll probably be engaged in some learning as you correct those mistakes and as you start to understand why those mistakes are relevant to the design of the computer system. Um, it's also easy to introduce security risks. Hopefully, uh, if we get through the main content of this uh, course, not through the semester, we'll do a fun little ex uh, lecture on computer security and cryptography, where I'll show you ways that you can hack into someone's computer if they've written a bad C program. Um, it's not type safe, so uh, we'll, if, for those of you who have seen some other languages, you can look into that one online. The, the tooling to actually make a C program run, the compilers, the things that let you check your C code, have historically been really clunky and frustrating to use. And then there are a whole lot of just why on earth was the language designed this way kind of questions that you'll, that you'll probably ask when we see different things in the course. You'll say like, uh, Dr. Connie, why in C can I not use a number that's as large as I want? I'll say, well, back when they designed the C standard, uh, they had some difficult choices to make, and this is what they went with, and you'll give me a blank look. But uh, that might be a reason not to learn C, but at the same time, it gives you insight into design choices in languages and why things are done the way they are. So C was first uh, developed in 1969. Um, and two of the key figures in the development of C were Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ritchie. That's Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ritchie, who wrote the first book on the C programming language and were instrumental in its creation. Oh, who's this? Hi, to all the students in Foundations of Algorithms at the University of Melbourne. I'm Brian Kernighan. I teach computer science at Princeton University in the United States. I wrote the first book on C, along with Dennis Ritchie, and I helped build some of the early Unix tools, like the ARC programming language. I hope you're all enjoying learning everything there is to know about algorithms. Good luck with the rest of your semester. Semester. That bit got cut off. Um, so there's also a little more of the history that I think is worth knowing. Uh, Brian Kernighan worked at a place uh, uh, called Bell Labs, which was this wonderful research institution created as uh, the outgrowth of a monopoly in the US telecommunications industry. So there was this one really one big telecommunications provider called Bell, and they had a research lab. And has anyone heard of the transistor? Transistor, yes. You know the, the little chip inside your computer that makes everything work. The thing that ushered in the modern era of circuitry was designed at Bell Labs, and as a result, Bell Labs won a Nobel Prize for that. Um, in fact, they're one of the only industry research organizations to ever receive a Nobel Prize for their work. And I'm not sure why there's no audio in this, but here are some pictures of Homedale, New, New Jersey, which is where the uh, original Bell Labs was before it was um, uh, 
before the monopoly was broken up and Bell Labs ran out of money. But uh, one other important thing that came out of Bell Labs was the Unix operating system. Now, how many of you are on Macs here? Put up your hand. Macs, Windows, Linux, anyone? Got one hand for Linux, um, two hands for Linux. Um, so both Linux Mac, Mac, and, Mac OS, eh, and Mac OS are derivatives of this first operating system. I mean, there were operating systems before, but this was one of the really, really important early operating systems that led to an outgrowth of all the others. Um, and in fact, what we're going to be teaching you through some of the commands we use are commands that were originally devised for Unix and later became part of different standards that now uh, allow people, when they move from different computers, to easily communicate on that computer regardless of what the operating system is. So the commands stay roughly the same. Now, Windows went its own way and the commands are different, which is why we get you to install Windows subsystem for Linux if you're on a Windows machine so that you can use the same commands that everyone else is used to. But a little on um, looking at this history of operating systems. So I'm not sure if this will show up in the video, but uh, you can see unnamed PDP operating system. So this was the very first operating system of all time, well, kind of, um, and immediately after that is already Unix version one. We go through a whole bunch of different derivatives, different operating systems, different manufacturers. And then all the way over here, we finally get Mac OS. And then if I can see it, can anyone see Linux? I can't see it on here. Left of Mac, there we are. Unix uh, goes all the way over here and then down into Linux, which is another Unix derivative. Thanks for pointing that out. Who, what, was, what was your name? Max. Max, thank you, Max. Um, but it's not only operating systems that have this, oh, there we go, I had it highlighted in the next slide. Um, it's not only operating systems that have this kind of branching tree structure where ideas have been taken and used as inspiration for other things. This is one that's for programming languages. So I think this might highlight something for me if I press the button. Yes. Okay, so there is... So there is the C programming language. I'm going to just pick it up and put it on the table. There is the C programming language. And for those of you who know another programming language like Python, you can see it's all the way over there. But there are a lot of common links between C and Python. Um, and JavaScript is somewhere over here as well. I can't see it right now. But uh, I encourage you to look at these slides a little later and look at all the different programming languages you've heard of and try and pick out uh, what ancestors they have and what inspired their development. And for those of you who are asking, like, why is a language called C? Well, yes, there was, in fact, a language called B. And C was directly inspired by B, and so uh, the next letter on. And what about C++? There we are over here. It was an extension from C. They added some extra features, and they're like, well, this is a lot more than C, but it's not all the way at D yet. Let's call it C++. And there is a D language, but I'm not sure it shows up on this chart. No. Um, I think there's an F, there's an F sharp. Is there an E? Anyone heard of an E programming language? Not as far as I know. Okay, so enough about all this uh, talking about programming language theory. Okay, oh, there we have Python, Java, JavaScript, C++. We're finally, finally ready after all my yammering on to actually write a program. Okay, there we go. So I am going to um, write our very first program, and I'm going to call this hello.c. Now, I'm going to use a program called Emacs. I don't expect any of you to learn this, but it is just a way for me to type code in here and edit a text file. And there we go. So it gives me a blank screen where I can type some things. This looks probably a bit like mumbo jumbo, but don't worry, by within a few weeks, you'll know what all of it means. Okay, what should I put in here? Anyone have a guess? Very good. Now, what might I have forgotten already? I need a new line character. So just like in Python, C has new lines that are represented with backslash N. 
But unlike Python, one thing that I need to do for every regular line of code, I need a semicolon at the end. One other thing about C that is going to be important is the idea of return codes. So once my program is over, I need to tell the computer that my program is over, and so I'm going to return zero in this case. And we'll talk a bit more about the correct return code and what should I do a little later. But okay, I've written this, I've saved it. Now let's go and run it. So remember, Python is, uh, sorry, C is uh, compiled or interpreted. So what do I need to do with my code before I can run it? I need to compile it, okay. So I've got two compilers, two different programs that uh, we'll use throughout the semester. I've got one called GCC, uh, which stands for the GNU, GNU C compiler. And the other one is called Clang. And we'll talk a bit more about the difference between them later. I'm just gonna try one of them now. Hello.c. Didn't seem to do anything. This is because my program is compiled. So I haven't actually run my program. So I'm gonna run my program. And to do so, I'm gonna type dot slash. And then, oh. Sorry, I have some extra files in here that I didn't think should have been in there. Okay, let's do that again. Now I'm gonna type the command ls. ls is the command that you can use to list everything in a particular folder. So I'm in this folder called code, and I can use this command pwd to see where my directory is. So shanunci, library, mobile, dot, whatever this long path is, and then I'll use ls to list everything in this directory. And I see all these files, and I don't actually know in this case which one was my uh, hello.c. It seemed to uh, put it, to compile it to something um, other than hello. I think, however, that it might be this one. Oh, yeah, that's hello world. But we don't want to get confused. We don't want to have to guess which one of the files in the directory was the output of the compiler. So what we can do instead is we can give it the dash O flag. We tell the compiler, we're going to give you some more information about what we want you to do. How does the compiler know exactly what extra instruction it's going to receive? It gets something called a flag that starts with a dash. And dash O means call the output what I'm going to type next. So we're going to call the output hello. And the input file, which it doesn't need a special flag for, that's just the next thing, is hello.c. So now I'm going to type ls again, list everything in the directory. And if I look over there, I see there's a file called hello. So let's run hello. Hello world, great. So now let's do the same thing with GCC. There shouldn't be any difference. Dash O, hello, um, hello.c. Actually, I will remove hello so you can. I can prove to you that it's working. There it is again. I run it. And just to be 100% sure where I am, because very often during semester you'll think, I'm sure I, I ran that command right, but it doesn't seem to be working. Always make sure you're in the right directory. So there's pwd, print working directory. Um, and I can see I'm, I'm in the place I expected to be. Now, one more common mistake. Let me try this. I'm going to do something, give ourselves a little more breathing room. So CP is a copy command, but don't worry about that one. I am going to put this the other way around. So I am going to do hello.c, hello. Does anyone have a guess about what this will do? We'll give an error message. We'll give an error message. Any other guesses? Okay, let's run it. Okay, it gives an error message because there's no file called hello. Um, but now let's say that I have already made the hello file. Oh, let's, let's just try with test.c. What about this one? What will this do? Assuming that test.c is a valid C file. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph, okay, let's see what happens. I'm gonna run this. Seems to run fine, nothing seems wrong. And then I'm going to try and run hello. Hello still prints hello world, because that's the program I made before. 
but I want to continue writing my program hello.c. That's not what I expected to see. Uh, this, sorry again. Joseph. Joseph is totally correct. Um, by giving it a dash O flag, that is the name of the C file, I've actually overwritten the thing that I was working on. So there are a bunch of ways to avoid this. One is to make sure you save regularly. Another is to use something like a cloud service that has history. And then something that we will get to probably in an extension video is to use something called version control that allows you to save your changes as you go and name those changes. So that gives us our very first program. I'm going to now restore using the move command, hello2. I'm going to move hello2 into a file called hello because I was clever and made a backup. Now if I open that again, I'm actually going to use a different command this time. I'm going to use the cat command and open hello.c and let's see what's in it. And that's what I expected to see. Um, my hello.c file is there. So what did the cat command do? Okay, Joseph, you're, you're banned from answering first for, for the rest of class. <laughs> Got to give everyone else a second. Um, but thank you, yes. Cat uh, prints whatever the contents of whatever the argument was. So if I want to see what's in test.c, I can just do this. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that code a bit later. So there is a beautifully highlighted version of our hello world. We're doing something, we're including something at the top uh, that looks a little like something in Python. What, what's the word in Python that might look similar from someone who hasn't programmed in C before? Not quite a comment. It does, it, it's got that hash at the start, the pound symbol. So it looks like a comment, but what word is similar to include in Python? Oh, and I, what was your name, sorry? Uh, Elaine. Elaine. Yeah, include sounds similar to import, so what it's probably doing is it's bringing in code from somewhere else and then letting us use it. Um, and why do we need to import something or include something in the terminology of C? Well, C doesn't come with batteries included. None of the functions that you really want to use, like printf, are present. So instead, we once we figure out the function that we want, we've got to know which library it's in. In this case, it's standard input and output. We include that library, and this is the syntax for doing so, and then we can use the function. Um, but what we wrote was really just a text file. It, it, there was nothing special about it. The actual hello.c is not the program itself. Again, what we have to do is we compile it, and that turns our text file, which has everything that programmers have agreed on is the C language, and the compiler follows those agreements and turns them into the machine language. So what we did then was we went to a shell. This was the thing you saw me typing commands in on the laptop. This screen over here, this, is, this was our shell that allowed us to type in commands and actually instruct the computer what we wanted it to do. Um, the program that runs the shell is called the terminal, and I can zoom out on that. Actually, I'll show you that. So I've maximized this to... Uh, um, so you don't see my desktop and everything, but here you see the environment that I'm operating in. This is a program on my Mac called iTerm2. Now iTerm2 is just a way to display all these windows and for you to run your shell. It's not the same as the shell itself. The shell is a special program that takes in these commands and does something with them. And so the programs that I was using, like uh, ls and cat and cd, Oh, I haven't done CD yet, and PWD. These are all commands that the shell recognizes. So this special shell program is programmed to understand some of these commands. Now, as well as the built-in programs, the shell can also be used to launch new programs that are not built into it, like Hello, the program that we just made. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of different text editors. I was using Emacs. And one fun historical note is there's another program called VI, or Vim, and people who use Emacs hate people who use Vim, and people who use Vim hate people who use Emacs. This is called the Editor Wars, and if you're interested, look up on Wikipedia to see a long cycle of hatred and disunity in the computer science community. Um, and there's one more command for you to play around with there, cd is change directory. So I'll do a quick example of this. Um, so let's say I want to go out of the directory I'm in, one step out, 
I do cd dot dot. That means go out one level, go to the parent directory, which means the directory that had the directory that I uh, was previously in. I'm now going to do pwd, show you what directory I'm in now. I'm in the lecture2 directory, but I want to go back to the code directory because that's where all the code is. So I'm going to do ls just to see where I am. Uh, there I've got Brian Kernigan's hello and my code directory. And so I'm going to change my directory again and go back into the code directory. Now if I do ls, oh, there's all my code for the lecture. Great, we're still on track. So along with the shell built-ins, we also have access to all of the programs within uh, on, on the computer. We'll talk about that more in a little second. And the programs that I was using before to compile were these two over here, GCC and Clang. Now one kind of gotcha for anyone using a Mac is that when you type in GCC, GCC is not normally installed on Macs, but it'll work. What's actually happening is Mac tricks you into actually using Clang when you type GCC because Apple developed Clang or were the key contributor to Clang and so they make that the default. So even if you type in GCC on a Mac, unless you've done something special and intentionally installed GCC, you're going to be using Clang. But that's perfectly fine. Maybe in some of the advanced topics of the course, I will talk about a few of the differences, but for the most part, they're interchangeable this semester. So let me go back here and type in hello, and we should expect to see hello world, right? Right? Command not found, hello. Okay, that's strange. Why can't I just go into my shell and type hello or hello world if I call the program hello world? What am I doing wrong? Okay, I've forgotten the second syllable again. Eugene, okay. So I'm not in the wrong directory, but that's a really, you're really, really close. Okay, bouncing off Eugene. It is trying to run hello as a command. Something about what Eugene said. Uh, what was your name? Ash. Ash. It doesn't know where to find this file to run. Yeah, it, it doesn't know where this hello world file is. I mean, you'd think it might be obvious that it would look in the current directory, but it turns out that if you give the computer the instruction to always look in the current directory for things, if you have labeled a file name the same as a program elsewhere on the computer, you'd get super confused. The computer wouldn't know which one to run, and you would get confused because you wouldn't be sure if you were running the file in the directory or the one that's someone else in the computer. And so we need to give the computer what we call a path. There's hence the yellow brick road. So dot is the shorthand that you can always use for the current directory that I'm in right now. So if I go back to my terminal, what should I type to make hello run? Dot. And if I type in dot hello, that's not going to work because then it thinks that dot hello is the name of the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'll add a slash to say current directory and inside the current directory, which is the slash, look for hello. Okay? I'll run it. Hello world. Great. Now here's another freebie command. Clear. Just going to wipe my screen. And don't worry about memorizing all of these. Uh, we don't actually assess the commands. They're necessary for you to get used to, to uh, get used to working in a terminal. But if you've forgotten one of the commands, it's not the end of the world. So I'm going to go out of directory. I'm in lecture two now, and there's code. What if I want to run my hello program now? What can I do? What was your name? Haruki. So what, what could I type? I type code, okay, a dot slash, code, and then it was hello. Let's try that. It works. Now let's try it like that. Also works. So it depends exactly on what shell you're running, what program is controlling this, whether you can do this shortcut or not, but it's always safe to type it like that. Great. So we now know how to compile and run a program but we still haven't figured out how to really do much useful with our program. So let's write another one, and this time we're going to do some basic input and output. So let's code something up from scratch. Let's call this one basic I, uh, and I think next lecture I will try and get it set up so I can use um, Visual Studio Code, which is what a lot of you will be using uh, in, in the class. But this works perfectly fine. 
Okay. Okay. Guesses for what I've just done. Yeah, this is a comment. What about... Say a bit louder. Yeah, multi-line comments. Okay, you're very fast at this. You figure out the C language. I don't even need to be here at all. Okay, so what should I do next if I'm trying to get input and output? Remember in the previous program I needed to write something at the top of the file? Okay. And does anyone remember what I wrote last time? C-I-O, okay. And then I'm going to include another one here that you'll see start to see a lot. This is the standard library. This is full of a whole lot of basic building blocks that you might want to use. Now I'm going to do my mysterious invocation again. Um, now one thing to note is that whenever I write a C program, I'm always going to start with this main function. This is a function called the main function. It's very special because the compiler always looks under its normal mode for the main function. And whatever is inside the main function is the place where the program starts. So if your program isn't running, remember that you can't just write code. You first have to have a main function. Now let's uh, do just some basic things. Okay, this is a new function. We haven't seen this one before. Okay, so now I'm going to give all of you about 20 seconds, turn to your neighbor and just say what you expect the output of this program to be, or what this program does, sorry. Turn to your neighbor, or the person behind you if you don't have a neighbor. Okay, that's probably enough time. Um, person in the overalls, I don't know your name yet. Yeah? Bell. Bell. Okay, what do you think this program does? Uh, takes an input and then prints it out. Okay, that seems like a pretty good guess. Let's, let's give it a run, and then we'll return to looking at it and see if Bell is correct. Oh. So, run Quang. Okay, it hasn't done anything. Why hasn't it done anything? Okay, maybe? Other guesses? Okay. Have you answered today, Becca? What was your name? Ahmed. Ahmed? Agrim. 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 Uh, sorry, I was asking the guy before. Agrim and Ahmed. Ahmed. Okay, Agrim and Ahmed. Both the uh, A names. Okay. Why why isn't it doing it doing anything? So Bell said that this program reads in input and then gives us output. Have I given it any input? Should I expect any output? Okay, so it hasn't uh, done anything for us yet. Let me try give it some input. Okay, um, printed five and then 6.7, just like I gave it. Now, what do you think would happen if I did the other way around and gave it 6.7 and then five? What do we think? No? Let's see some shaking heads. Someone's been reading the textbook. Let's see what happens. What was your name again? Tata. Tata? Uh, yeah. Tata. Okay. Let's try that. Ah, oh, now this is really strange behavior. So this gets to what we'll talk about uh, mostly tomorrow, but what we call the type system. C, unlike Python, requires you to be very clear about what variable is going to contain what kind of value. So we created an integer like this, int n, we set it up, and we created a double. A double is a decimal point number, 
There also is a float, which is a bad version of a double, but that actually gets used for uh, machine learning. But if, more on that a little bit later. But a double is a, a number with some decimal points and an integer. And if you give a double, and you tell the computer that you created a double, and you try and put an integer in there, it's probably not going to work automatically, or at least you have to be really careful about how you do that. Likewise, if you've created an integer, but you give it a number with a decimal point, it's also going to do something strange. I mean, in, in the case of doing it that way, it is well defined. The C specification does answer what should happen. But you should still be very careful and not do it unless you really know what you're doing. So that's our very brief early introduction to types. And then we have our two functions, scanf that has this wild syntax, and then our printf as before. Um, and then exit success. So where did exit success come from? Anyone have a guess? Yes, exit success is in the standard library. And if there is exit success, there is also probably exit failure. So if I run my program now, and I do 5 and 6.7, nothing has changed. But what I can do is I can get the shell to give me what happened to the last program you ran. And oh, let's see, let's do it like that. Nope. Um, I obviously don't know my shell well enough. Cat reads out a file. This is what I'm looking for. There is a program called echo, which prints whatever the thing that comes after it is. Not, it doesn't open a file, it just prints whatever you've told it to. So if I tell it echo hello, it prints hello. So now I'm going to do this, question mark, and it gives me a zero. And now let's see what happens if I go back to base I.O. and I do exit success. me, and then I do that. Hmm. Oh, I didn't run it. Yeah, thank you, Liam. But also feel free, if I do something stupid like that, your job, you're not doing your job if you don't point out to me what I've done. So now let's try that. Still not working. I'm using the wrong... Uh... That's right. Right? Okay. Theoretically, it should have uh, changed the value there. I'll get back to you on why it didn't. Yeah. That's why I was confused. Let's try this one more time. If it doesn't work, that'll be our failed demo for today. We'll have a few of those throughout the semester. I did compile it there. There we go. Exit one. So fa exit failure will make the program return one, um, and exit success makes the program return zero. Um, and so if you were joining multiple programs together, the next program in the line could tell that the previous one had failed. Now, in this case, I'm just using my special shell trickery to figure out what happened. But uh, you might be joining together multiple programs that rely on the success of the previous one. And by knowing what happened with the previous one, if it returns success or failure, the next program in the line will be able to do that. OK. Phew, I thought something was wrong with me. OK. So now we have our scanf and our printf. And the syntax for these is getting more confusing. So if you buy a new TV and you can't figure out how to get it working, what do you do? Read the manual. Your name again? Elaine. Elaine. OK. So read the manual. And uh, if we were guessing what the program to get read the manual was called, what are we going to guess? Guess? Man? Who is that? Did you, did you already know? Cheating. OK, but yes, uh, one might assume they were type manual, but it's shortened to man. And so this is the manual for all the programs on the computer. Some program developers are not good at this and don't actually write the manual that they should. But for everything in the C standard library and for a lot of the C language, you can just type the thing you're looking for. So let's type in printf here, or let's do scanf. Man, scanf. Oh, OK, there are all these different functions it's going to tell us about. And here's a description once we scroll down a little. And the scanner family function scans input according to a format as described below. The format may contain conversion specifiers, the results from such conversions. Okay, this is, this is getting long and difficult to read. Okay, conversions, let's see. Now let's scroll down. Following the percent character introducing a conversion, there may be a number of flag characters as follows. Okay, let's scroll down to one that we actually used. Ah. 
Here we are. D matches an optionally signed decimal integer. The next pointer must be a pointer to an integer. Okay, so that's getting us a little further in the class than we want, but we can see that D whoop, matches a signed integer. So a sign is just whether it has a positive or a negative in front of it. If we go back here, and we see percentage D, and then we have N after the comma, because this is one of the arguments to the function, just like in Python, our function is gonna take a series of inputs, the first input being the format specifier, and the next being the variables that the format specifiers are referring to. So we have a percentage D for a decimal, for a signed integer, sorry, for a signed integer, not for a decimal, and then LF, which is, stands for long float, and a long float is a double, because doubles are twice as long as floats. So then we give it X. Um, the ampersand symbol is creating what we call a pointer, but we're gonna talk all about those many weeks from now. So for now, just remember that if you're using scanf, you need to use the ampersand in front because you need to make a pointer. Don't worry about what that means. Printf's are a little simpler. We have the same rough syntax in that we're gonna have our format specifiers, percentage D and percentage F, and our new line as before, and then the variables as usual, but this time we don't need the special ampersand symbol. So let's give that, we've already run that. Let's run it one more time just to be sure. And it gives us the output we expect. So what is the lesson? Read the manual. In the next uh, lecture, we're going to be looking at the following chapters from the book. We're going to look at arithmetic operations, logic operations, iterations, functions we probably won't get to till next week, functions and loops. Um, and we'll also talk much more in detail about C's type system. And I think that's where we'll leave it for today. Thank you very much, and I will see you right tomorrow.